family, there's much work to be done. I was blessed to go back and check on the children. And, and they're back there and they're answering questions. They're eager to, to raise their hand. And, and I, I remember being one of those children. And I thank God that they have an opportunity to with the youth ministry in front of them, asking questions and listening to them and, and talking with them and, and sharing, communing with them today and talking to them about the offering today so you can begin to understand what those things really mean. A amen. These last few years, many of our children have not been really physically with us in church, so it's just good to know they're in church right now. Amen. Amen. And, and I, I, as a pastor, I, I have a lot of pastor friends, a lot of ministers I talk to and talk with. And it's good to, to hear from other perspectives as to what's happening in those churches. And people say, Pastor, we ain't got no children here right now. And I said, I understand. But they're still there. We just have to get them back in here. Amen? So I you know, did an inventory and said, you know, last year, 2022, graduating class, we had 18 high school graduates. That, that's a lot of young people. And those are just the ones that went through the process. And now this year, we're trying to get ready for those that will graduate this year. We have to go and get those young people. But not just the young people. We've got to go get the people. And, and that's where being a worker is. And I believe when the Lord said that the, the, the harvest is, is plentiful. But the workers, the laborers, are few. And I believe that we're still few. Amen. And I don't believe God was talking about, you know, big churches versus small churches. I think he was talking about what's, what's within the people. There are few that are willing to give of themselves to go and tell somebody else about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have about 8 billion people on the planet right now. And some folks run around and, and they believe everyone's saved and going to heaven. Everyone has heard the gospel. But you and I know people that have not heard the gospel. You and I have family members that have not heard the gospel. We have friends and we have co-workers that have not heard the gospel sufficiently to allow the spirit to work in their lives that they might cry out, what must I do to be saved? So there is much work to be done. It's not about getting more and more folks to sit next to us in church. It's about helping to build the kingdom of God. There are folks that are lost, and they are not reading the Bible that you're reading, but they're reading you, and they're reading me, and we are the only Bible they'll ever read. You a deacon at the church, you a minister at the church, you go to church every Sunday, and, and I've seen no change in your behavior, in the way you live your life, and they're reading that and saying, ain't worth going to church. So we find our words, Scripture today, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. May God continue to bless his holy word. May God be with us as we share around this show, his word with these people. We pray right now for receptive hearts and minds, God. Be with this, your humble servant, God. Allow me to decrease as you increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes we don't know how to decrease. Sometimes we get in God's way. Tell the truth. Sometimes we're all about ourselves. We're not about the harvest. And sometimes we don't recognize that, that God is the Lord of the harvest and not us. Amen. So God gives us reminders every, every now and then. He gave me one this morning. I laid the suit out, ironed it, got the shirt ironed, amen. Got everything all, got the jewelry out, put it out there, you know, got a watch. I got a little brace to go with the watch. They match, amen. You know, put on the cross, amen, make sure it was in place and straight, you know, put on my collar. I was ready. I was rushing. I was trying to get the sermon together in my head, thinking about things that happened last night, yesterday, all these things going through. My, I was busy, 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 and, and I stopped and prayed that God would be with me as we continue to prepare the message. Lord, help me, help me, help me. And, and you know, I said, I'm going to be looking good today up there. Deacons look good. They black and white. Me, I'm right with y'all, brothers and sisters, Amen. 
And then I, I, I put on my shoes and got to church, drove to church in the rain, got here and walked in and said, something feels different. Something feels funny, man. Right feet, foot feels different than the left foot. <laughs> don't go there, Deacon Sam, don't go there. <laughs> oh, I was looking good, feeling good. And looked down and I had a black shoe on my left foot and a blue shoe on my, shoe on my right foot. I said, okay, God, I got it, I got it. It ain't about me, it ain't about how I look, it ain't about how I sound, it's about you. <laughs> so I come in, I call my wife, and after she stopped laughing hysterically, <laughs> I said, can you bring, can you bring my shoe? <laughs> she said, which one? I said, the, the black one, bring the black one. <laughs> and I'm glad she didn't bring the blue one, but. I said, bring the right shoe, not the left shoe, the right. I said, which foot side? I said, the blue one's on the right foot, so bring the black right shoe. <laughs> and I said, cool. And, and then I said, it's not just that one's black and one's blue, but one's a slip on and one's a tie up. <laughs> so, Sister Ruth, you're not laughing, you're laughing with me. Brother Mac, y'all laughing with me, right? Amen, not at me, amen. <laughs> we are the workers. We are the workers. The harvest is plentiful. And the workers are few. And some of us, we're workers, but we are not part of the harvest amen and God needs our hands and he needs our hearts he needs our eyes of compassion to help his people for God knows those who need to come to and understand who he is he knows those who who are lost and on their way to H E double toothpicks he doesn't want them to go and he needs you and he needs me let me rephrase that he doesn't need us but he wants us involved in in the work Amen. God could have told the angels to go to earth and evangelize the earth. And now if you were in the midst of your sin and, and doing your thing and an angel showed up, you'd straighten up real quick, wouldn't you? Now you and I walk in there, hey, you need to learn to know about Jesus. People say, oh, please, let an angel show up. <laughs> so I think they would have been more effective, but God chose you and he chose me. So after Jesus Christ had been tempted in the wilderness, Amen. For how, how many days? 40 days. Whenever there's a question, you think we're talking about time, just say 40 and you might be close. Amen. 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted of, of Satan. And, and again, he, as he was being tempted, he, he beat Satan back with the word of God. He used the sword of the spirit to, to beat him back. Amen. But we, 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 we find that in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, that's where we find that scripture of Jesus Christ being in the wilderness. And after he comes out of the wilderness and he begins his public ministry, the ministry of preaching, proclaiming the good news that the king come. Now, mind you, at the time, he is the only one preaching the good news. He's the only one talking about the kingdom. If we think about his cousin, John the Baptist, he is now in prison. He ain't preaching nothing. So Jesus by himself preaching. But he also, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knew a time would come that he would have to leave this place, leave earth, and ascend back to glory. And he knew he had to, had to prepare somebody to stay here. So he prepared the, the, the apostles, the disciples, and then their kids, and their kids, and their kids, preparing us to go and tell somebody the good news about Jesus Christ. We find in Matthew's Gospel 4, 17, says, From this time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He then calls his first disciples, his first apostles. And once he called them, then he went up a mountainside and began teaching them. He began teaching them his, his first sermon. Ministers, y'all remember your first trial sermon? I remember mine. I tried to forget it, but I do remember it. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't know what I was talking about. But his first sermon really was the Sermon on the Mount. Most, firm, the most famous sermon of all time. If you go through and you 
begin to preach the Sermon on the Mount and just read the words and, and put an explanation point here and there, and it might take you about 25 minutes. It's not a long sermon. So I, I preached twice as much as the Lord did in his trial sermon. And I'm going to rein that in a little bit. Amen. About 25 minutes he preached and he talked to them about the sermon. He shared with them what was on his heart. Again, in Matthew 5, 1, he went up the mountain. In Matthew 7, 28, he came down the mountain. And then he began to, to, to put into practice some things he talked about. He began his, his preaching and teaching. Now it's his healing ministry. He began to heal everybody. We find in, in Matthew uh, chapters 8 and 9, there was a lot of healings there, a lot of miracles in, in, in that scripture there. Amen? He shared with his apostles the, the spiritual teaching and about how the kingdom of God had to be lived. Amen? So after coming down, he began healing many, many folks. Read in, in, in 8 and 9 of Matthew. You'll see more healings you'll find any place else in the biblical writ. The teach of Jesus and then his actions, they were an effective demonstration of, of who he was, of his authority as, as, as one of God's, not one of God's prophets, but as the son of God. He demonstrated that he had the power and the authority to forgive sin. Amen. We find these words in Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 5 and 8. He says, which is easy to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This was a new teaching family. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw him, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Christ was a different type of teacher. They had never seen anything like this before. But up to this point, he has just been teaching his apostles. They've not been doing anything. He's been teaching. They've not been involved in ministry. They've not been involved in healings. They've not been involved in, in, in proclaiming. They've just been sitting there on the side of a mountain listening. And now things are about to change. And now he's getting ready to send them out into the highways and byways. And he's getting them ready. God's getting you ready, family, to go out to the highways and byways and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need a seminary degree. You don't need a Ph.D. You don't need a college education. Go out and tell someone about just how good Jesus has been to you. Amen. He wants the laborers to be more than few. There are more laborers out there in the world that we have to go get. And sometimes our church, we want, hey, it's comfortable here today. Why don't they come and sit next to me? They're not coming to sit next to you until you go out there and show the love of Jesus Christ. We got to show the compassion that we have for God's people. Amen. So we've got to go. Again, the words and teachings of, of the Son of the Mount in Matthew 5 and 7 and the healings and miracles of Matthew 8 and 9, they are bracketed by words that we find in, in, in 935. 935. It says, Jesus went through all the towns, village teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. That's Matthew 9, 35. So again, let me share three points concerning uh, there is much to be done. Uh, the, the first point is Jesus knows his ministry, verse 35. He knows his ministry. Amen? But we look at 35, but also bracket that 23 of chapter 4 brackets that. It brackets you know, um, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and the healings of 8 and 9. When we look at 4.23, the words are very similar, almost verbatim, to 9.35. 4.23 says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among his people. That's 4.23. That's a good word. But we find again in 9.35, Jesus went throughout all the towns, all the villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He brackets all this good Bible. He brackets the, the Sermon on the Mount. He brackets all his healings, all his miracles. He brackets those with talking about what he did. He went through all the towns and all the villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news and healing every disease and sickness. He did these things because he had compassion of the people. He also understood his own ministry. He knew why he was called. He knew why he came. He was about his business, amen? Amen. From an early age, he knew uh, he was about his father's business. Praise God for that. Amen. This is why he came. He came to 
take care of his people. He came to make a way for us to get back to glory, back to the, the Garden of Eden. We have been kicked out because of our sin. He made a way for us to get back into the presence of God, that God might hear us and God might be attentive to, to our needs. Amen. He had a task to complete. He had a purpose here on earth. He had a ministry. He had a divine appointment given by the Father. And he had to be about his father's business. <laughs> Over in Luke chapter 2, I won't go to that scripture right now, but Luke 2, 41 through about 52, we find that Jesus Christ was with his father and mother, and, and they traveled uh, to, uh, for the Passover. They were traveling, and, and they were, after they were going back home, uh, they began to look for Jesus. They couldn't find him. So for three days, he was missing. They went back to where they came, and they found him in the temple. And he wasn't just in the temple. He wasn't on the back row playing with his cell phone. No, he, he was in the midst of the teachers and the, and, and, and the leaders of the church, of, of the synagogue, and, and they were asking him questions. And they were listening to him. And they were amazed and astonished at his answers. He knew he had to be about his father's business. So he was there. Imagine this. He comes into the temple and sits down, and they begin to ask him questions. And listen to his answers. Oh, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm here to, here to tell you, amen. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, but he's about the Father's business. He came to teach. He came to proclaim. He came to heal. And that's why he was about his Father's business. And you and I need to be about his Father's business also. So Jesus Christ, he, he, he's in the temple, and he, and he quotes from, from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. We find these words in Luke's Gospel 4, 14 through 21. These words, Jesus returned to, to, to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news of him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has appointed me, anointed me, to, to, to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to reclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to reclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That first point, Jesus Christ knew his ministry. He knew why he came. Amen. You and I, hallelujah. We got to figure out why we're here. We got to figure out what our purpose is. I figure out what Christ has for us. We can't just sing the song, what God has for me is for me. We got to find out what God has for me is for me. We got to begin to live what, what the biblical writ tells us. To go ye therefore and teach all nations. To baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We got to go. As soon as in the biblical writ, when God called, he then sent. You and I have been called, and we have been sent. We are the workers for the harvest. And we're going to get busy harvesting the people that God has for us. Amen. When on earth, in his incarnate body, the Lord knew that he could not physically be every place at the same time. So he had a little community of disciples. He began to build and, and to grow right there. But they were very small. But his message was very, very big. And because he had a big message, there were and, 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 and a whole lot of healings that a whole lot of folks came looking. They called a crowd. Amen. The crowd came looking. And sometimes they came looking to be healed. And sometimes they came for a two-piece and a biscuit. They came to eat, amen. They came for the miracle, but still they came. And because they came, his disciples had to be prepared to minister to them. They didn't know how. They were fishermen. They were carpenters. They were tent makers. They were all these things, but they were not preachers. They were not pastors. They were not evangelists. They, were, they had nothing to do with that. But now he's preparing them to go, and Christ has prepared you and I to go. Many of us have been in church all our life. We had to learn at least one thing we can share with somebody. Amen. 
We might not know how to dot the I's and cross the T's. We ought to be able to tell somebody that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We ought to be able to explain to somebody that he died for your sins and he died for my sins. And because he died, when we die, we shall rise again. We ought, to be tell, we ought to be able to tell someone that he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again. He's coming to receive us. We ought to be able to share at least those two things. Amen. Christ is not calling you to be a theological giant in this world. He's calling you to understand that he is the son of God. And you ought to be able to tell someone that he saved your soul. And because he saved your soul, amen, you have a place in eternity. Hallelujah. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. One of our, our, our members, young ladies in college, down in the Florida area, called me last night, just had to talk to her pastor. And sometimes you don't know how, where's this going to go. She just needs somebody to to pray because the world is a, is a, it's a mess and you're away from home and you're away from mama and daddy and from the church and, and you can't keep seem to find a church locally. I said, you got to find us, find us at alpha bc.org slash <laughs> go to your church's website and find us. Come and see us on Wednesday night at alpha bc.org slash prayer dash meeting on uh, Thursday evening and Bible dash study on Wednesday evening and, and morning dash prayer on, on Monday through Friday. So she said, thank you, Pastor. Didn't know I, yeah, you can do that. Because she needs connection. Connection. Because the world does not want our young people to be saved. It wants them to be lost. Amen. So we have to be the workers in the harvest field. Talking to folks about Jesus who is the Christ. Amen. So again, Christ used that, that little flock of disciples, apostles, to go first and then to train others to go. We have been on the battlefield for some time. We ought to be able to train somebody to go. I'm glad I know a few folks that will take my place. I know a few folks who have come through this church that will continue to do the work after I'm gone. I know some folks that, have talk, that are talking about Jesus Christ right now the way I talk to them about Jesus Christ. That should be our legacy. Amen. Who did you tell about Jesus? Who have you shared the gospel with? This pandemic has been tough. Amen. But Jesus Christ is the same. He has not changed. The word is still the same. Amen. Hallelujah. We have all lost somebody and has been devastating. It has hurt our hearts, but the same one that was with us when he gave you your, your loved one is still with you. Never going to leave you. Never going to forsake you. But wants us involved in the work. Amen. The crowd flocked to them. They were eager to hear the good news of the kingdom and to be healed. They were ripe, and Christ recognized that. But he knew his own ministry, and he was preparing his apostles, his disciples, to take his word to the masses. Again, they were uneducated. They were not road scholars. They were not PhDs. They were not trained to be preachers, teachers, or events. But Christ had them right where he needed them, sitting at his feet, learning one word at a time. The one thing about them, they were available to be used by the Lord, and we must be available to be used by the Lord. If we know our ministry and what God has for us to do, we got to get about doing it. Amen. So again, the second point I'd like to share with you is that Jesus knows the condition of the people. Amen. It's not that he just knows his own ministry. He knows the condition of the people. He knows his context. And we've got to know our context. The one thing I, I pride myself on, if I can use that word, on around here at Alpha Baptist, I know my context. I know who our people are, Sister Lynette. I, I talk to y'all enough, don't I? I bump into y'all. Hey, how you doing? I hug y'all. Amen. I share with you. I, I see you when you're your lowest. I see you when you're your highest. I'm there when you're having joy. I'm there when you have sorrow. I, I know my people. I, can I call y'all my people today? Yeah. I mean, y'all not my people, but I know. Uh, come on, brother. But as you know, I know my people. Amen. I know my people. And you know me too, brother Frank. 
<laughs> so I know my context. And I know the condition of my people. Christ knew his context. He knew the, the people he was dealing with. He knew what they needed. We find these words in Mark, excuse me, Matthew 9, 36. Then he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He knew that they were in trouble. He knew they were lost right where they were at. They were spiritually lost and many of us today are spiritually lost. Many in our community are spiritually lost and there is work that must be done in order to save them. Amen. We are the ones called and invited by Christ into the work. That work I like to call incarnational transformation, telling people about Jesus Christ, to change their destination from hell to heaven. A amen. They are spiritually lost. We must look at our community with spiritual eyes and, and eyes of compassion. We must di di discern the condition of the people that we minister to, that we've been called to, to be in their lives. Amen. Today, many Christians, we, we tend to, to have a view of non-Christians as we're afraid of them. We don't want to get none of them, none of that stuff on us. It might rub off on us. No, it sh we should rub off on them. Amen. So many of us, we like our fish already. <laughs> Scale, cut the head and tail off, fillet it. We like fillet of fish, don't we? We don't want no fish we got to catch. <laughs> Bubba is out there, <laughs> and he is not easy to catch. <laughs> Amen. And we got some folks out there, they're not easy to catch. They don't talk our language. They don't dress like us, look like, but they, they, have, they have a need. The same need that we had and what that long ago. Tell the truth. We were lost just like they are lost. Amen. Amen. People, they were lost spiritually and they needed salvation. Jesus Christ saw the Pharisees and the, the, the leaders of the, of, of the synagogues. They, they were not doing what they should do. They were shepherds, but they were not good shepherds. They were bad shepherds. We cannot forget that we were lost. And some of us are still lost. We find these words in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 5. As for, for you, as for you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. Each and every one of us saved by grace. And we have to look out into the harvest field and help somebody else come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We don't save nobody, Sister Patty. But we can be involved in the work. Our witness can, can lead them. And the Holy Spirit can convict them. And they can cry out, what must I do? And they might be saved. Jesus Christ is still the one and only God. He is the one and only good shepherd. And God still longs for those who are spiritually lost. It hasn't changed. He still wants no one to perish. Amen. The Lord called, the Lord's call to mission has not changed since the, the, he first talked to his apostles. It has not changed when he talked to disciples about that, that first harvest field being plentiful. It has not changed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change. He had deep sympathy then. He has it right now. He has deep sympathy for the spiritual conditions of the people in that day and the people of this day. Amen. Everyone is spiritually lost without a shepherd. And folks need to come to know that good shepherd. A good shepherd who knows the condition of the people. Amen. So again, that second point, he, Jesus knows the condition of the people. And he wants you and I to know the condition of the people that we minister to. Amen. Everybody in here knows someone who's lost. Tell the truth. 
I don't care if you like them or don't like them. We still know they're lost and we want nobody to go to hell. So there's much work to do. And Christ has called you and I to do that work. Amen. The third and final point, Jesus knows the greatest need. He knows. You, you know when your car don't start, Christ knows it ain't going to start. When you ain't got no money in the bank, Christ knows you ain't got no money in the bank. You know, when your tooth is hurting and your, your crooked toe is giving you problems, amen, when, when, when you got on the wrong shoes, he knows. But Brother David, your greatest need is to know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins. And he knew that the greatest need was for folks to come to and understand who Christ was, that they might have a, a place prepared for them when they take their last breath on this side of glory. Amen. We find these words in Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord the harvest, therefore, to send our workers into his harvest fields. Amen. Amen. Are you one of those workers Amen. with a heart for God's people who know your ministry, who recognize the, 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 the condition of the heart of people, and we understand, understand there's a need for folks to come to know Jesus Christ. That everybody in this world is not getting to heaven. And the only way is, is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We can stop trying to, 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 to stroke folks and say, okay, everybody gets getting in. Just live right and do the right things that you're in. No. Tell them the truth. The word of God lets us know that without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have, you're lost. You will not have a place prepared for you in glory. For glory is a prepared place for a prepared people. And we have to be that prepared people. And prepared people prepare others. Amen. So we got to help prepare others for, for meeting Jesus Christ one day. Well, we all will stand before him. And I want him to say to me and to you, well done. Good and faithful servant and faithful. Come on in. But there are others that we know will not hear that. There is much work to be done. Jesus Christ knows the parameters of ministry. He knows those who will be saved and those who will not. Jesus Christ knows the parameters of ministry. He knows those that will go out and tell others and those who will not. Jesus Christ understands the parameters of ministry. He knows those who are lazy. And those who are too busy. And those who have not first seeked his kingdom, his righteousness who are not looking to do his work, but looking to improve and enhance their own star. There are those walking around who don't even understand they got on the wrong shoes. But we got to stop and, and put our eyes on the Lord and listen. So when I talked to that young lady last night, and, and I, I just I told her she had to slow down and listen. You have to slow down and listen to what Christ is saying. And I said, the internet is, is, it can be horrible, but it can be so good. I said, any question you have, Google it. Ask Google. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but ask Google. What's the best scripture for worry? Type it in there. She said, said do not worry. That's right, do not worry. Write that one down. But it doesn't stop there. Do not worry what? Do not worry about anything. What you're going through is, I've been there. I said, I've been there. So my wife and I, we were, we were youngsters in college all by ourselves trying to make our way and, and, and navigate through this, that, and the other and get good grades and do this and play and blah, 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 all these type of things. I said, we've been there. I said, but right there, what's it say? Do not worry about anything but dig miles. Pray about everything. That's all I can share. Just pray about everything. I said, you know, again, you anxiety. Google it. It says, do not be anxious. What? That's the same scripture, Pastor. Do not be anxious about anything. But prayer, petition, make your request on to God, the peace of God. I, he will give you peace in the midst of it. So again, we, 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 we thank God for his word. We thank God for his presence, his Holy Spirit that's within us that will help us to do the work in the harvest. Amen. Jesus knows the needs of people, and he knows that, that, that 
all of us are not making ourselves available to him. The folks from this church, members of this church that I speak to every week that have not been to this church in, in, in close to three years, and I've seen them everywhere. No mask on, eating and hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hold it, don't, don't. You're around other folks you don't know. Breathing their air. And, and, and then they give me a call. Yeah, Pastor, I, I, you know, I have the, the virus. Amen. You didn't get in church, did you? I know you get in church because I ain't seen you there. I'm, I'm, I'm messing right now. But we have been called to be those harvest workers. And if we're sitting at home on Sunday morning and every other night and every other morning doing going to work and doing our thing and going to parties and doing our things, but we're not telling folks about Jesus Christ and we're, mess, we're missing the point. We still have to go and tell folks about Jesus who is the Christ. Amen. I don't believe when Jesus said the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few that he was complaining. He wasn't a complaining spirit. He didn't have that kind of spirit. I don't believe he was complaining. I don't think he was saying there's not enough people I believe he was speaking the truth <laughs> about the way things were and the way things are. That some folks are just too busy. Too busy for him and too busy to do what thus saith the Lord. So I don't believe he was complaining, but he was stating the fact. This is what it is. The, the, the harvest is plentiful. Do we all agree to that? Amen. And the works are few. Do we all agree to that? Amen. So he was not complaining. He was not telling a fib. He was telling the truth. He was speaking the truth. About the things. Jesus was moved with compassion for the lost sheep and expressed the need for workers who would stretch themselves to help others. Some of us never stretch ourselves. I have a people say, Pastor, I want easy ministry. There is no easy ministry if it's ministry. When you're dealing with people that are lost, it is not easy. When you're dealing with people that are on their way to H E double toothpicks and they don't mind, it ain't easy. You got to stretch yourself, amen, to give of yourself, to sacrifice some of your time and, and some of your stuff, amen, so that somebody else might benefit from it. It's not easy. We are called, are being called to reach the spiritually lost people with the love of Christ. We're called to tell them the good news about Jesus who is the Christ. And again, up to this point in ministry, Christ Jesus has been doing it all by himself. He was the sole missionary up to this point. He was the sole teacher up to this point. He was a sole proclaimer up to this point. He was a sole healer up to this point. No one else was doing those things. The apostle was sitting back watching. And now the script has changed. The apostle had remained in the background. Now he's pulling him to the forefront. Go out. And go and touch and go and teach and go and preach to somebody else. Amen. Amen. This is a turning point in Matthew's gospel about Jesus Christ. He, he now begins to switch to a new kind of rabbi-disciple relationship. Amen. Where Christ is not just teaching the disciples anymore. Now he is, he, he is ready to involve them in the ministry of preaching and, and teaching and, and, and healing. Amen. He knew that his life on earth in his incarnate body was temporary. And now he began to prepare for his departure. He knew that there was much work to be done. And in 2022, there's still much work that must be done. And we are the workers. Yeah. Hallelujah. John's gospel, 14, 15, 16 said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And be in you, amen? Thank you, God. There was and there is a need for, for spiritual workers. While the harvest of souls was and still is abundant, few workers were and still are few. Jesus telling the disciples he will not complete the mission by himself here on earth, but he would lead them here to begin to spread the gospel. I'm here to tell you, don't get it twisted. He doesn't need us doesn't need us. Hallelujah. But he wants to use us for our good and for his glory. I don't know about you, but I've been some places doing some ministry 
And I went in feeling down and woe is me and help me, Jesus, and came out helping somebody else out and felt like, what was that? Man, I was feeling down, went to cheer them up, and I come out, what? That's called ministry. Amen. He doesn't need us, but he will use us. He doesn't need help from anybody or anything. Know why? Because he's God. Because he's sovereign. Because he can do anything he wants to do, when he wants to do it. And how he wants to do it, because he's sovereign. God the Father, he is the Lord of the harvest. And he alone has the sovereign authority to do what needs to be done with the people of God. They're his people. I joke around, I say, when y'all being good, y'all my people. When y'all being bad, y'all belong to God. But we all belong to God. Amen. We're all God's sheep. The sheep of the pastor. I remember someone told me one time we had a quarterly meeting and it didn't go the way that they wanted to go. And they came in to me and said, Pascal, you let, you let the sheep run the church. <laughs> and I reminded that deacon, I said, you sheep too. He's not here anymore, I can say that. He might be listening online. If you listen online, brother, I didn't mention your name. But <laughs> I had to remind that, that leaders, you can call me, I'm the, the servant leader, I'm the, the spirit of this, the spirit of that, I'm the bishop, I'm the apostle. No, I'm a sheep. We're all part of God's pasture. And it's work for all of us. Your work is different than my work, but we all got work to do. Do work for the master. He has called the Father, Lord, before. He says the Lord of the harvest. We say Jesus Lord. No, Jesus didn't say he was the Lord of the harvest. He said his Father is the Lord of the harvest. We don't believe he called God Lord. Think about when he was in the, in the wilderness and Satan was tempting him. He told him that if you just bow down to me, I'll give you everything. He, he said, all this I will give you, he said, if you bow down. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. <laughs> For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Christ said, no, I'm going to worship my God, who is my father, and serve him only. Amen. God has invited us to be co-laborers of his spiritual harvest. Remember the woman at the well in, Ma in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 4? She was there, and, and she had been involved in multiple husbands. And The man you're with right now is not your husband. And she began to listen to Jesus Christ, talk about the physical water, led her to the spiritual water. Amen. He knew what he was doing. And then she looked back, and the apostles came, and, and they were like, what's she doing here? And she said, my meat. We find these words in John, John 4, 34, 38. My food or my meat, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop. For eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of the labor. You've got to go out, family, and, and we got to reap a harvest that we have not planted, a harvest we have not watered. We might be the last one to ever hear from, but we got to take the word of God to the people. Amen. The people are ripe for inclusion into the kingdom of God, and we are those kingdom workers. We are those harvest workers to tell people about Jesus. Amen? He told disciples, and he's telling you and me to continue praying that, and asking God for more laborers, more workers to share in the good news of, of, of telling others about Jesus Christ, to help them move from a point of spiritually dead to spiritually found. Amen? He wants workers who are willing to do the important work. There's some follow-up work. For folks that come to know Jesus Christ. Some folks just want to bring them in. But we got to do some follow up work. We got to help disciple them. So they might understand who Jesus Christ is. Amen. And have a, the Lord in their lives. Amen. I'm here to tell you God is not worried about the few. He has all those he needs. He wants more. Amen. There are some out there that we have not gotten for the kingdom yet. We're about discipling people. Not just getting church members. We got to go out to the highways and byways and tell folks about Jesus. So they might come to understand who he is. He's the son of God. Amen. He's all that and more. 
we think about where it was. We ain't got enough numbers in this church or that church or the other church. But remember back in Judges chapter 7, when, when Gideon was there with 32,000 fighting men. He was about to go and, and fight against the, the, the Midianites. And God said, you got too many. He said, if you got anybody that's, that's fearful, tell them to go home. The scripture says that 22,000 went home. Amen. Let them go home. They all right. He said, you still got too many folks, got 10,000 troops, too many. If you go and fight with 32,000, 10,000, you win, you're going to say, look what I did. But God said, I'm here to tell you that I am strong in your weakness. So he said, you still got too many. He said, go down to the brook. Let them get down and drink. And those that drink like, like dogs, get down there and, and lap it. He said, 300 got down and lapped from the hand. He said, those are the ones to fight with. He took 300 men. They fought against thousands, thousands of men, and they won because the Lord was on their side. As you go out into the harvest, recognize you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it in the power and strength of the Lord. He's with you. He's not sending you out there to do it all by yourself. The results don't belong to you. The results belong to the Lord. Amen. The results belong to the Lord. When you're doing your ministry, remember, the results belong to God and not to you and not to me. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 300 is all you need. All you need is one plus the Lord is the majority in any fight. Know that when you're fighting for the Lord, when you're witnessing for the Lord, that you plus the Holy Spirit will get the job done if it's God's will. We must pray, not my will, but thy will be done. We must give God glory, honor, and praise for how he has used us in ministry. There is much work to be done. And you and I, we are the harvesters. You and I, we are the workers that must go into the harvest field and tell folks about Jesus who is the Christ. I pray you spend time this week talking to somebody about Jesus, being part of the harvest field. Go and get the folks. They're there. There is much work to be done in the harvest field. The truth is that the spiritual Harvest is still great. And the sad truth is that the workers are still few. Be one of the few laborers. Be one of the few workers and go and tell others about Jesus. Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest for more workers, more laborers. And recognize that we are not responsible for the growth of the kingdom. God alone is. The Lord seeks our cooperation in prayer in going to where the lost are at. Any of us as believers in Jesus Christ can be co-laborers to help God's work in helping the lost to find the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to use us to share the good news of salvation to those who don't know it. So Father God, bless us right now and keep us, God. We pray for this word has gone forth that our people will stand up, God, and make themselves available to you, God, to be used in your harvest field. For the harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still few. Help us to be better workers. Help us to pray in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit for more workers. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people God say amen. Amen. The Lord's worthy. Give him a hand. He's worthy. He's calling.